Hi, I'm Robert Crow. I'm with TFX DevRel at Google, and with me today are. Hello, I'm Ahmed Altai. I'm a software engineer working on Beam. It's lovely to join you on this digital platform today. Hi, I'm Reza Rockney, uh, Dataflow DevRel, and I'm based out of sunny Singapore. And we're joining you from lockdown in California and Singapore. I hope everything's going well for you. We're going to be talking about distributed processing for machine learning production pipelines. So let's get started. When we think about machine learning, we usually focus first on the modeling code and our data, uh, because that's what's going to generate an amazing result for us. And it's what the research papers are written about. It's what we get excited about. But when we move to a production environment, we discover that there's really much more that a production solution requires than just a model. This is especially true when you're not just training your model once, but you're retraining it over the lifetime of your product or solution. And people discover this, that it's actually quite a lot of work to get from your initial model that looks great into a production system. So this is a, a typical uh, response that, that we've seen. When you're doing production machine learning, you have all the things that are normal to worry about in machine learning development. Where are you going to get labeled data if you're doing supervised learning? Make sure that your feature space is coverage, minimize your, your dimensionality, maximize the predictive data in your data. Um, things like fairness are especially important. Uh, to make sure you're not unfairly disadvantaging uh, groups or just neglecting parts of your customers. There's rare conditions like healthcare where uh, you have situations that, with conditions that you may see very infrequently but are very important. But then over the lifetime of your data, you're going to need to worry about the life cycle of your data and your, and your model. But when you're moving to production, you need to add all the things that you need for any production software deployment. So issues like scalability and extensibility, consistency and reproducibility. When you're retraining models, those are especially important. Modularity and best practices, testability, safety, because we know, and security, we know that there are attacks on models. So this was a paper that was written, uh, geez, it's been five years ago now, still very relevant to today's world. Talks about a lot of the issues uh, in uh, bringing machine learning models to production. Um, I, I highly encourage, if you haven't read it already, uh, to go take a look. So we need a pipeline in order to really make this work in production. And you can think about some of the pieces that are necessary. You're going to need to ingest data. You're going to need to train. You're going to need to do feature engineering. At the end of the process, you need to push to a serving environment of some kind. So these things all need to be part of, of a solution that you're going to architect and put into production. And that's what we've done with uh, TFX. We've created these pieces in an open source solution that's available to you now. And these are ready to run with for uh, multiple environments. And we use it internally. In fact, the reason we developed TFX was because we needed a production solution for the, you know, across the, the, the different alphabet companies, including Google. And you're probably recognizing some of these icons. It's used all over, all over Google. And it's used by our partners too. So for example, uh, Twitter was coming from a torch-based environment and they uh, evaluated the different options that were out there because they were Reevaluating their production solution. And what really drove them to TensorFlow was the advantages of the TensorFlow ecosystem, including TFX. And now over to Reza. Hi. So in this section, uh, me and Ahmed will be uh, covering Apache Beam. So the vision statement for Apache Beam is to have a unified programming model for both batch and stream data processing pipelines, 
uh, for it to be portable. So you as a user should be able to choose the execution environment of your choice and for it to be extensible. So people should be able to add SDKs, IO connectors and various transforms as libraries and be able to uh, share them. Now, the uh, if we concentrate on the last two parts, which is the portability and the extensible piece, um, today we have Java, Python, and SQL, and uh, Go is in development. So these are uh, languages that the user can use uh, to construct their pipeline, um, sort of express them. And uh, there are many uh, runners uh, available today. Obviously, Flink, there's also Dataflow and Spark. Um, so the user should be able to uh, write the pipeline in the language of their choice, uh, submit it to the runner for the execution, and operate operations like sum per key should have a uniform meaning across both SDKs and runners. Now, um, in terms of the components that are available within uh, Beam to building your pipelines, um, we have peak collections, which are a unordered set of data, which is immutable once the peak collection has been created. Um, for example, the input and output. Uh, we have P transforms. These are transformations that you can run operations against one of many uh, P collections and the pipeline itself, which allows you to construct uh, the data processing pipeline with um, your transforms and P collections together. Um, producing what this actually produces is a DAG, a direct, direct today cyclic graph computation uh, that the, can be executed upon. In the graph below is a typical example reading from a database with a read transform. Um, uh, creating a P collection, which is then transformed again, for example, through enrichment or analysis into other P collections before you write it out to the uh, database tables. And with these uh, components, you can actually encapsulate lots of uh, application logic as the TFX folks have done. Uh, as we can see in this uh, graphic, um, data ingestion, TensorFlow data validation, TensorFlow transformation, and TensorFlow model analysis are all powered by Beam. So they've used uh, the Beam primitives to actually build out uh, these pieces, uh, these components. And uh, what that allows us to do is uh, once you've built your TFX uh, pipeline, once uh, you as a user have constructed it using the TFX components, and normally you would do that with um, something called the local runner, which is a development environment, uh, which allows you to execute locally on your uh, laptop, for example. Um, you uh, can then productionize this by simply changing out a configuration from saying to run it against a the local runner to run it against Flink or Dataflow or Spark. And this moves it to being able to be run on a production environment. Um, as we uh, mentioned in that very first slide, there was three components in, the, in that Beam vision. One of them was the ability to uh, process uh, pipelines, both stream and batch. Um, and as you would expect, and I'm sure uh, given this conference, uh, you're all very well aware of the importance of event time uh, processing versus processing time processing. Um, and the Beam model does have uh, event times available. And uh, in this nice graphic, we're actually seeing the effects of event time versus versus processing time as we're doing a computation for a sum uh, based on data coming in at various data points. Um, out of the box, Beam supports several uh, windowing uh, functions. There's a fixed window, which allows you to do a fixed uh, piece of time, um, a sliding window, very good for moving averages, for example. Um, these come out of the box. There's also um, a, a session window. A uh, session window is an example of a merging window, and this is quite often used for clickstream analysis, where you have per key, uh, you're um, looking at the uh, events coming in, and when there is a gap, in other words, a user moves away and does something else on their browser, uh, the clickstream uh, for that key uh, stops, and within that air gap, then you create a, a session. Um, so this is an example of a, a merging window. These three were uh, are out of the box windows that are available with Beam, but you can create your own custom windows, and um, uh, uh, as well as being able to create custom triggers. And we'll come to that in a second. So as you would expect um, yeah, with any stream analytics uh, to be correct uh, in the analysis, we're going to need to be aware of watermarks. Um, so again, part of the Beam model is uh, understanding of watermarks and it is actually the default trigger used uh, when ascertaining whether uh, uh, the data is complete uh, and, and should uh, go downstream. Um, of course, you can actually uh, 
use different triggers as well with the Beam model. Uh, so you can compose different triggers based on your uh, use case outside of the default uh, watermark one. OK, so let's quickly have a tour of some features of the Beam Python SDK and see how we can use these features, what are the requirements, and how it can enable you to do things. First, a quick note on Beam requirements. Beam consists of transforms and collections. Transforms takes one or more collections and produce more collections. And collections could contain any elements as long as they are serializable. And similar to the elements of the collections, the transforms and functions need to be serializable. And the reason for that is Beam needs to distribute both transforms and collections to various workers. And serializability is important for us to be able to distribute across workers. Let's cover a bit about the Beam Python syntax. Two special operators here. One pipe operator is used to apply or chain different transforms one after another. And right shift operator is used to add labels. This is useful for debugging or monitorability. In the first example, for example, we are looking at a map transform, which is a transform that comes inside Beam out of the box. It adds plus one to elements of each P collection, input P collection, and produce a new P collection. And it's labeled add one. So beam pipelines start with an input or multiple inputs. And there are different ways to create inputs. One of the simplest ways will be the create transform, which takes a static list of elements. And from that static list, you can run your transforms. And this is really helpful for testing and running locally in your environment to test out your new transforms that you are writing. After that, there are a lot of transforms and IOs that comes out of the box in Beam that you can read from different file systems, different IOs, and it's very possible to write your own if that is what you need. One of the core transforms in Beam is element-wise transforms. Pardo is one of them. In this example, you are looking at a Dufon that's named key by first letter. Its input P collection has this storm flink apex spark elements, and it output P collection have key value pairs of the same values mapped to their first letter. And the code is a very simple function that given a word, it returns a tuple or a key value pair of a letter and a, the same word again. It's possible to produce multiple outputs from the uh, same Pardo. And one example of that is like, let's say your Pardo is dealing with some uh, parsing and certain items are unparsable. So those elements can go to another collection like a dead letter queue. And you as a user will know which elements were not being able to process by your Pardo. And you can e either improve your Pardo or you can clean up your data. But you can get an exact list of things. But the, the main point is your Pardo can produce different outputs. Here's the code for how to do this. The, it's very similar to the previous code we looked into. Instead of returning elements, we can yield them to a specifically labeled outputs. In this case, uh, outputs were user labeled as success and failure. Side inputs is uh, transforms can take on their input a single P collection or multiple P collections. For secondary and tertiary and et cetera, uh, P collections, we call them side inputs. They are similar to broadcast joins and other data warehouse type of applications. One typical example is with this, you can pass back an element like a count, and you can use that information to, let's say, filter out certain number of elements from your DoFund for its output P collection. It's possible to have branches in the graph that is given an input P collection. That same P collection could be pro processed by different transforms to, to different things. Grouping is an important aspect. And group by key is the transform that comes out of the box. Given a set of key value pairs in a P collection, it will group them. In this example, what we are looking at is the example from the previous slide. And the output will be the collections of the first letter and all the values that start with that first letter, for example, S for storm and spark and so on. And the code for this is really simple, just beam.group by key. Special case of grouping is like combiners. Beam supports combiners and allows for in-graph optimizations to get benefits of the combiners. It's possible to use Python Lambda functions, or it's possible to implement a certain 
uh, interface called combine fun to implement any uh, amount of complex combining functions that you need for your pipelines. Windowing is another transform. This allows to group your inputs to logical event-based time windows and do processing within that time windows. And once the whole processing is done, we would like to produce some output. Again, being comes with a large set of output producers, write to text is one of them. And you can take your P collection and write to wherever you would like to write it to. P transforms compose. As in the first example, we are counting words by applying a map and another map and combining to create a sum per key. And they are also really easy to test. For example, beam comes with a P transform called assert, assert that, that can be added to any pipeline and you can assert certain aspects of the P collection and test your drag runner or even in production. And if you bring all this together, we will have a large pipeline that reads from one or multiple places. In this case, it reads from an online database and a store database. And it will apply different map functions to bring them in some sort of a similar order, flatten them to combine a single P collection out of two P collections, and apply some combining operations and a top operation to find, let's say, top selling items, and write these data to BigQuery. Write to BigQuery is one of the out of the box write transforms that comes from Beam. Both Beam runners and Beam model are fairly complex projects and they have a lot of power aspects. We would like to highlight one or two aspects and see how they can help you with accomplishing your data processing goals. First, a quick look into the classic parallel IO. In the typical parallel IO, we have a single worker working on a large chunk of thing. And ideally, if this is parallelized, we can take that simple thing and divide it across different workers in a uniform way. However, this typically doesn't work in the sense that different workers will get different amounts of work. And one simple example of that is we may have four files that we acquired from different servers, and they may be of different sizes each, and we could do our initial splitting by passing one of these log files to a different worker. That means the initial work distribution will not be fair to begin with. Beam model through its splitable Dufan framework allows dynamic rework balancing. That, that means after the initial splitting, the work could be redistributed across workers based on the dynamic runtime information. This requires support from the runners. Currently, Dataflow runner supports this feature. But in the future, we will hope that other runners will support similar features. Another feature is cross-language support. Beam model allows combining transforms from different languages. That is, you can include a P transform from Java inside your Python pipeline. And similarly, you can include different Python transforms inside your Java pipelines, and so on and so forth. This applies for other languages that supported B or Beam as well, for example, Go. In this example, we are looking at an almost toy example that uh, a Python pipeline is using it to generate sequence transform written in Java. But why this will be really important, or when this will be really important is, in Beam Java, we have significantly large set of IO transforms that's available. And all of these transforms will be immediately available, all of Python users. This is still in the works, but soon enough, we will have this ability. And similarly, our Java users will be able to embed Python transforms, such as TFX-specific transforms in their Java pipelines. Just to give you a sense of how important the first factor will be, this is the large set of Java transforms that's available today that we hope that will be all available to all of our Python users immediately after the support for cross-language transforms. So 
Going back to uh, this slide and talking about the portability framework. So uh, why was the portability framework in Beam uh, put together? The uh, When Beam originally came out, the idea obviously was that we would have many uh, different languages available for people to be able to uh, write their pipelines in. Um, however, the reality was that for a very long time, the only language that was available was Java. And uh, eventually Python Batch came along and it's taken some time and we, we now have Python Streaming and Batch. And the, one of the reasons was that with the original model, um, the uh, cost for building a um, the SDK runner combinations was very high on the uh, on development community. Um, so a few years ago, the community got together and has started to put together the uh, portability framework. And what that does is radically reduce the amount of effort needed to be able to build um, these uh, SDK runner combinations. Um, specifically, it's an interoperability layer for the whole Beam ecosystem. And um, the two primary components, job submission and management, so this is the runner, uh, a runner API, and job execution through um, uh, the SDK harness. And it uses protobuf and gRPC for, for the communication layers. And of course, one of the uh, cool external, uh, so uh, sort of other benefits to um, uh, the portability framework, as well as uh, more SDKs and, and runners, is um, the fact that we would be able to use cross-language transforms. So being able to build a pipeline using different uh, language uh, transforms from different languages uh, all in one place. So you could start with a Java pipeline, and um, because there's an interesting library in Python that you want to make use of that may not be available in Java, you add the Python transform into your uh, Java pipeline. You could add Go, SQL, etc. Um, all of these uh, would then uh, be submitted to, to the runner. And in the, the next couple of slides, we just go how uh, go through how that process works. Um, so you would start constructing your pipeline as normal in, uh, let's say, using Python as the, the SDK of choice. Um, you would uh, then make, say, for example, need access to a Java transform. Here, you will put in your Java transform as an external uh, transform. Uh, this is then sent to the expansion service, and the expansion service will then take the transform along with the parameters, uh, do some processing, and, uh, for example, extracts here that there is the um, uh, uh, int value uh, as a param, and returns that to the client SDK. So the expansion service will return that piece, which is then plugged into the graph. And then from there, you continue as before. Once the pipeline has been fully uh, completed, it is then submitted to the job service. And the job service will then run that and is responsible for running up the different workers and SDK environments that are needed to execute the uh, DAG. Um, and I'm really, really uh, excited to see what uh, good folks like yourselves will come up with, uh, given uh, the power that this is going to uh, provide. Um, in terms of uh, where we are with it, so portability has been uh, in development for a while, and it's um, uh, today there are uh, Flink and Dataflow which supports it in uh, for Python for both uh, batch and streaming, and we're sure the other uh, runners will be catching up uh, soon. So uh, very excited to see where where uh, folks go with this one. Um, back to uh, Rob. So now let's take a look at TFX components. A component is made of three pieces. There is a driver and a publisher. And in the middle, there is an executor that does the work. The driver reads the data from metadata. And the publisher takes the result and puts it back into metadata, creating artifacts. The executor is where the work is really done. And different components will do different things. And the executor is usually what distinguishes that. So here we have a typical component that is taking input from the metadata store. It's taking input artifacts. It's doing its thing, and there's a configuration that, that tells it how to do that. And then the result is put back into uh, the metadata. And that's how data flows in and out of the metadata store. And it's how data flows between components. So there's dependencies between components. 
And as soon as the dependencies are satisfied for a component, that component is eligible to run. So to run it, we need some orchestration. And there's different ways to do this. We could wait for the process to finish and just do task aware uh, orchestration, which works to some extent anyway. But it's more powerful to be able to do task and data aware orchestration where we're using the dependencies in the metadata storage to determine whether or not a component uh, is eligible to be run and also whether or not we should run it. And you can bring your own orchestrator. There's, uh, there's three that are available out of, out of the box. There's uh, Airflow, Apache Airflow. There's Kubeflow. And there's Apache Beam as well. And I should mention there's a fourth too for doing development. There's an interactive context that runs in a notebook. So at the end of the day with a, an orchestrator, you're going to end up with the same dependency graph or DAG, it's a directed acyclic graph. And it'll look different depending upon which orchestrator you're using, but the graph itself will be the same. And I mentioned this orchestration in a notebook this is really useful when you're just kind of, you know, putting things together uh, and you're trying to work out uh, just getting things working. It, it uh, allows you to run without an external orchestrator. You can just run everything inside a notebook. So let's talk about metadata for a second, because as you probably noticed, metadata is a key part of putting together a TFX pipeline. So what is in the metadata store? Well, there's artifacts. So things like trained models, data sets, metrics, uh, results of different transformations, all of that becomes an artifact in the metadata store. And those are associated with execution runs. So each pass through the pipeline is an execution run. And the artifacts that are generated in that pass uh, or that execution run are uh, associated with each other. That makes lookups uh, a lot, lot easier to do. And one of the things you can do is trace back and find the provenance of an artifact that was generated. So you have a model that was trained. What was the result of the feature engineering before you trained that model? And what did the statistics look like on the original data set? So finding out what data a model was trained on uh, in a lot of cases is very important. It's a, certainly a key part of explainability. Uh, being able to compare different model runs is also very important. And we have TensorBoard that we can use to do that. And then there are a lot of cases where we don't need to rerun a component. And remember, we might be dealing with very large data sets. So a component could take hours, even days to run but if the input to that component has not changed, we don't want to rerun that component. We want to take the previous result out of cache and use that instead. So carryover state, including uh, worm starting when we're training a model. If we want to continue, say we trained for 10,000 epics and we decide we want to train for another 10,000, we don't want to start over at the beginning. We want to pick it up from where we left off. OK, so there are a number of standard components that come with TFX. But I want to emphasize that you can and often will create your own custom components as well. So starting out at the beginning of the pipeline, we're going to ingest data with an example gen. And this is what it looks like. And that's the Python configuration for it. It's just a couple of lines of code. This happens to be CSV, but it could be whatever input format uh, you need to, to use. So there are a number of different example gens. And these leverage Beam because, again, we want to be able to handle large amounts of data and use it efficiently across our resources. And Beam is a great way to do that. Statistics gen generates the statistics, basic things like uh, the min, the median, the max, the standard deviation of different, uh, different features that we have. What are the valid uh, values for categorical features, things like that. So uh, statistics gen also leverages Beam to do it. And it also leverages 
a library called TensorFlow Data Validation. And TensorFlow Data Validation, or TFDV, gives us some nice visualization tools that we can use, for example, looking at the histogram of different features to look and make sure that we have uh, good coverage of our feature space. SchemaGen really focuses on the types of the data. And it uses the results from StatisticsGen to do that. And so it's looking for things like in numerical features, are they floats, are they ints? Uh, you know, you can have strings, you can have uh, uh, categorical features and so forth. Example validator takes both of those results and looks to see if there are problems. So problems being uh, a value in an example that is not the right type for that feature uh, or a value for a categorical feature that shouldn't, shouldn't really be in that category, things like that. It's not foolproof, but it gives you a good uh, starting place at least to uh, look for problems with your data. And transform. So we're following, you might have noticed, a typical ML development process. We started with ingesting data, then we did some statistical analysis of it, and now we're moving on to feature engineering. So transform is one of the more, one of the more complex uh, components because Depending on what your data looks like and what your model needs, feature engineering could be arbitrarily complex. And it uses Beam to do that. So it leverages Beam for a lot of the feature transformations that it's going to be doing. And a key uh, part of Transform's output is a graph. So this graph is a TensorFlow graph so it's TensorFlow ops, including constants or, or operations like multiply, um, that is going to be applied to the beginning of your model as the input stage of your model in both training and serving. And that eliminates the possibility of training serving skew, where you may be trying to do the same feature engineering in two somewhat or very different environments, could even be different languages. And hopefully you get it right, but why not take the chance? Or why, why take the chance? We can just use the same exact uh, code and the same exact graph in both places. Trainer takes those results. And of course, your model, which you started out thinking about, and it trains your TensorFlow model. So it has the kinds of, of configuration parameters that you would expect, things like, uh, you know, how many steps, where's my data, should I use worm starting, that sort of thing. It produces a saved model, and the saved model is used by the next component, evaluator, to do deep analysis of your model's performance. And by deep analysis, I mean not just a top line like AUC for your entire data set or, or RMSC for your entire data set but individual slices of your data set. So for example, individual geographies or individual products or individual stores or individual uh, demographics within your, your customers. And that allows you to understand how model performance varies across these different slices. So there's some domain knowledge that's required to identify what slices are important. And this uses TensorFlow model analysis, one of the libraries that is uh, used by uh, TFX. And one of the things that comes with that is some nice visualization tools that allow you to dig into the results and really understand what's going on. Pusher, the next component, takes uh, the previous result from Evaluator, which included a comparison between the model that you already have in production and this new model that you just trained. Because if the new model isn't better, or at least as good as the current model, then you don't want to push it to production. And if Pusher sees that it did pass, it, it was blessed, then Pusher will push it to your deployment targets. And those could be a, you know, a, a serving cluster using TensorFlow Serving, could be a mobile application using TensorFlow Lite, 
could be a JavaScript app uh, environment using uh, TensorFlow.js, or you may just be pushing it into a repository to use later for uh, generating embeddings uh, or for transfer learning. Bulk infer is a kind of a special component that you can use when you're doing bulk inference on your model. So you're, you're going to batch up a bunch of inference requests and you're going to run them all at once and get a you know, whole batch of results. So in the end, this is what you end up with. Uh, it looks about like what you'd expect but these are only the standard components. Remember, you can create your own components to add to your pipeline to do the things you need to do. So this gets you started, but don't feel at all like you're limited to this. And now over to Ahmed. All right, we have looked into TFX, Beam, and Flink, and how well they're integrated with each other. And together, they provide you a great environment for running your distributed processing pipelines for machine learning in your production environment. So let's wrap it up by looking into the key points again. Beam, with its portability feature, allows any Beam pipeline to be executed on any Beam-supported runners. Apache Flink is one of those runners. And it's possible to build Beam pipelines using various languages, Java, Python, Go, SQL are some of these languages. Flink is one of the well-supported runners that supports Beam portability APIs. It's possible today to run your production Python batch and Python streaming pipelines on Flink. TFX is integrated and built on top of Beam pipelines. Here, uh, TFX integrated pipelines are marked by powered by Beam. And these pipelines use all the portability features that is enabled by Beam. And what this means for you is that you can build your machine learning pipelines, run it in your production environment. And whether your production environment is Flink, Dataflow, Spark, or any other Beam supported runner, it will run equally well. And TFX has been focused on delivering easy machine learning production. And you can take advantage of all these open source libraries that are well integrated with each other. And if you would like to learn more about any of these uh, components, we are leaving here a bunch of links for you to go and explore. You can find tutorials, notebook environments to try out, blog posts and video channels and links to our community. And we will really hope that you will stay in touch with us, ask questions, share your feedback and share your comments. Thanks a lot for listening to us today. And thank you very much for your participation. We are really looking forward to your use of TFX, Beam, Flink, and we are really looking forward to your comments and questions about our presentation of, or anything about these products. Thank you very much and take care.